Nemo Radio is on the air. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C. Closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! All right, welcome back to another episode of Nemo Radio, also some Nemo video for those of you that are watching. I am really excited to bring this guest on because I love finding people for my podcast and training videos and other content who kind of go against the grain. They're outside the box, they're different, they've got new ideas, and they're also really fun to engage with. And so Judy Carlson, who I'm about to, to bring on before I formally let you start talking, Judy, she is, I've determined, a force of nature. <laughs> Once you get Judy Carlson started, all bets are off because she's so passionate about what she does and the message that she carries. And so I want to just give people a quick introduction, Judy, and then let you kind of take over. But what Judy does is she provides wealth building and tax reduction planning for executives, entrepreneurs, families, and small business owners. Um, she's been around for you know many years doing this, but Unlike 99% of other financial advisors, Judy's also a CPA. She's licensed in two different states. She knows the tax code like the back of her hand. And what was really interesting was how Judy and I met, and then also her views on investment and you know planning and wealth management, and retirement. And, and most people listening to Nemo Radio might be like, well, how does this have to do with marketing or anything? But so many people I know, Judy, We've got to put money away. We've got a plan, especially business owners and cash flow. And like, am I going to have anything? You know. So I wanted to bring you on because I love your personal brand and I love your approach to how you share and engage with people. But I also found your advice on these topics really fascinating. So with all that said, welcome to the program. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. So start with start with your backstory because I want people to get to know you a little bit. Like me, thank goodness you're a Minnesotan, right? Minnesota. <laughs> so, Yay, Minnesota. But you're all in Colorado now. But but take us through your journey. So start with, you know, what happened. You went to the University of Minnesota and then take us forward from there, kind of the backstory. Sure. Well, when I was a junior in high school, I asked my dad what I should be when I grow up, and he said, Jude. People are going to need accountants and computer people. So I picked accounting, went to the University of Minnesota, graduated with my accounting degree, took and passed the CPA exam right after college, and started my career journey in the big eight public accounting firms. <laughs> <laughs> you don't strike me as someone, you're so, you're such a good business owner and force of nature, how did you navigate those internal kind of corporate politics? And I guess, what did you learn? Because you have this really successful backstory and career working for these big firms, working with huge brands and huge clients, huge accounts. What, what was that like for you? How did you navigate that? What did the experience teach you? So interestingly enough, in the company that I spent 10 years in, in the Minneapolis area, I was in their finance division and there were 12 of us managers and my niche was leadership and management. So while I had the technical background and could report financials monthly to the senior executive group, my niche was developing my people. And I loved working with them to bring them to the point of the best they could possibly be in their careers. So I took more of a servant role with them and people loved working for me. And I actually, when, when my boss would say, this person isn't a good fit in this position, I would help them find a better fit. And a lot of times it was outside the company and they're still grateful for those conversations that we had way back then. I think this is interesting because one of the things with your industry, your niche, and we're going to get into what makes you so different and unique in a little bit. I think people are going to be fascinated with your view about wealth planning and, and retirement and everything. But what for people that are in a high trust industry, because a lot of my viewers and listeners are coaches, consultants, trainers, 
a lot of financial planners, CPAs, tax firms, especially those high trust industries, because we're not just going to, people get funny about money, right? <laughs> so it's like, I don't know if I can really trust you with, how, how do you view that? How do you earn the trust of a prospect who becomes a client? What's kind of your strategy with that? Relationships. That's my favorite thing. I'm, I have a natural curiosity about people and what brought them to where they are today. And it's not necessarily just financial. It's their whole life. And I ask a ton of questions, and I'm genuinely curious and intrigued with each person's story. And sometimes I get to the point where I forget what we're even having our phone conversation for because... I go down a, a rabbit trail, but people love to share their stories, and I love to hear their stories, and I'm a good listener, and I think that's what bridges that gap. I think it's a great point for everybody listening and watching, too, especially the high-trust industries where we have to really service people one-on-one -on -one is – Everything now is so commoditized. Right. And one of the things that every service is, you know, there's a million LinkedIn trainers, there's a million CPAs, accountants, tax planners, whatever. But we, we cannot get past, and where I see a lot of people struggle, Judy, especially from our generation and even beyond, is the people that grew up pre-internet, like that's what we had to do. We had to build relationships. We had to meet face-to-face. -face. Now you introduce all these tools and LinkedIn and everything else. And what I see happening a lot is people forget how to still be human with this. What's your strategy when you're kind of connecting with people on social media, LinkedIn, prospective clients? How do you not lose who you really are and, and fall into that trap of kind of trying to commoditize and all oh, this is just a number of prospect, hammer out a script? How, how do you navigate that? That's a great question because I actually connected with a gentleman this morning on LinkedIn and he went to... Uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison. For boo! Boo! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's, I have to interrupt. They are, Judy and I are raging University of Minnesota. You better still be a Gopher fan. I am a Gopher there. fan. Okay, go Gophers. So yeah. we hate the Badgers. We hate Wisconsin. It's like the Hatfields and McCoys because I have people all over the world listening. like, why do you hate? I hate Wisconsin because it's state law in Minnesota. You have to hate your neighbors. In Wisconsin, <laughs> the Badgers are evil. But anyway... Carry on. You, you meet a gentleman from Wisconsin. Well, I'm surprised saw, you even talked to him. So what happened? Well, I saw his LinkedIn profile through a referral. And so I scrolled down through it before I sent my connection request. And I said, tragedy in Wisconsin yesterday, huh? Because Wisconsin got hit with a tragedy yesterday with the shooting at the... Oh, right. You know? Yeah. And he immediately connected with me. So I found something about him we ha that we had in common, even for the short, what, 320 character LinkedIn connection requests that you can throw out there. And he immediately connected with me. And then when I go into conversation, I do it more story-like, and I only really let it go one or two uh, messages back and forth before I'm like, hey, let's hop on a 10 or 15 minute phone call. I've got these times available. And then once I can get them on the phone, then I get into their story. And I love the lesson you just shared. And here I set it all up with ripping on Wisconsin. Here your your genuine servant heart was like, hey, I'm, I'm wondering if you're okay because this tragedy happened, which is totally me, right? Totally messing it up. But that's okay. <laughs> that's what I love about Judy. She is genuinely like, Hey, I know you live in Wisconsin. There was a bad event there yesterday. Here, I was thinking you were going to say tragedy in Wisconsin because of the Badgers or something. Oh, but anyway, no. we'll, we'll keep I, mean, I, live out, I live out of my heart, John. I know you do. You're too kind. You're too kind. You would never send. You would never send the kind of funny animated GIF emojis I send to Badger fans where Goldie Gophers beating up their mascot. But anyway. Um, how how do people respond to that? Because I feel like what you're doing on LinkedIn, even that personal, it's so different than what everyone else does. What happens, do you think, psychologically with someone when you do go in and personalize that way, as opposed to, hey, I'd like to require 15 minutes of your time for a no obligation phone call about your wealth planning, right? Like, what, what happens instead when you, when you take those couple extra steps? I think it starts to engage at more of a heart level or an emotional mm. level. 
and they have no idea what my agenda is. But by the time we get there, that level of trust has been built because I genuinely care about them. Wow. Okay. So I need to bottle that up and give it to all the financial advisors that are messaging. (laughs) This brings up a great teaching point from LinkedIn Riches, uh, the online course, which is far too many people on LinkedIn are trying to get married on the first professional date. They're not practicing any professional courtship. And yes, does it, but even your example, you just took a few seconds to scan that person's profile, look for something to break the ice, and then had a genuine kind of exchange about it before you pivoted into talking a little bit about business and why you're reaching out. And so I want to dive into this because we met through a phone call and helping you with some LinkedIn things. You blew my doors off because once you started talking about finances and wealth management, retirement, you were so passionate. I was just like, okay, I got to, first, this is a lot different than what a lot of people will say. And then second, it it makes a lot of sense once you listen to it. So let me start with this question. How, because you're bringing a message to people, and we're going to get into what your message is and why it's so unique and different with financial planning, but how do you bridge that objection or that gap with people who say, well, this, what you're telling me, Judy, about retirement plan and wealth management, nobody else is really saying this. This isn't the advice I get from my financial planner, you know, or my tax. Like, how do you get past that skepticism so that they don't just think you're out of left field? What we talk about has been around for years. In fact, almost 200 years. It's also been in the tax code for 107 years since 1913. And if a person is willing to stake their claim on something that's a solid foundation built on even biblical principles, rather than a tax code change that happened to take place that went into effect in the early 80s, it gets them thinking. I just want to pique their interest. I want to get them thinking. I want to ask them questions where they're like, wow. I I never thought about that. No one's ever pointed that out before. How come I haven't heard about this before? How come more people aren't doing this? And the answer is because the wealthy do it, the millionaires, the billionaires do it, which is why certain people can stand up and say, my administrative assistant pays more taxes than I do. And they won't, they they just don't share it. Not common knowledge. And this is fascinating because when you start talking to me about this, and now we'll get into a little bit of, of why you're different than the 99%, but, but I love the lesson too, for those listening, you know, sales and marketing lesson here and engagement lesson is Judy is using curiosity. She's opening, they call it an open loop. I think it's the Heath brothers made to stick book, a great marketing book, but an open loop. Like we as humans, we don't like to not know the answer. <laughs> you've piqued my curiosity now i need to know so let's let's open up a loop here let's let's play on some curiosity because one of the things you start with is you know you talk about 401ks and and so many of us are just like yeah that's what we do and that's what we put our money into and everyone does it so it must be right but you're saying you know you talk about there's kind of a shocking truth about this that you know and not to sound like conspiracy theorists or something but that the government really isn't telling you or doesn't want you to know So how do you explain, what's your view of 401ks and why do you think, you know, why do you have such a a directly different strategy? Well, 401k is an IRS tax code and the government set it up in the early 80s and they're asking people to earn income today, but to postpone paying taxes on that income until sometime in the future. Do we know what the tax rates are going to be in the future? No clue. (laughs) That's probably not good, right? Do we know when the government is going to require us to take our money out of our 401k plans or our IRAs? No. In fact, they just changed the rules January 1st of 2020. We don't know what the rules are. They set the tax code for how much of your 401k or IRA you need to take out in your future. So you wouldn't 
take a loan from a banker if you didn't know what the interest rate, the terms, and potential penalties might be, yet every day when an American goes to work and makes a contribution to a 401k plan or an IRA, they're entering into a debt with the IRS for an unknown tax rate at an uncertain date. And that's the analogy that you gave me when we were talking about this, just with my own interests with obviously self-employed having to put away money was, would you go take a $50,000 loan out at the bank, John? And they said, well, you know, you can pay it back. You don't have to pay any interest now, but when you have to come back, the interest rate could be 5%, it could be 50%. We'll just, you'll just have to see when you get there. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> like, I want guarantees. So what's interesting to me is how you got to this conclusion because, you know, you didn't come out of left field here. You're a CPA, you're an auditor, licensed in two states. You kind of grew up professionally in the big accounting world. How did you come upon this? What opened up your eyes to it and made you such an advocate of this approach? Gratefully, I became acquainted with some like-minded individuals many years ago across the country as I attended workshops and conferences. And I got wind of a completely different way to help our clients. And I burrowed down and I started studying and I started asking a lot of questions. And I went under the mentorship of some national professional mentors who discovered this lot longer ago than I did and joined together with them for the purposes of being mentored for learning so that I could take that knowledge, experience, and expertise to each person that crosses my path through the rest of my career. That is so interesting to me. And I just, I'm thinking about how it it takes a lot of courage, doesn't it, to Yet you're one of those people, Judy, like you dig in deep and you're very analytical, kind of getting to know you. Like you're not, you're not like, I'm just going to fly off and chase this bright object. So obviously you did your due diligence, but what's so interesting, and I relate it to my journey because so many of my friends or other people will say, well, it must be easy for you, self-employed, you're just lucky, whatever. And it's like, no, I'm taking a very different stand and a very different belief, which is you can take whatever your passion is and monetize it. If you work hard enough, we live in the best era ever to be an entrepreneur, to build a business out of nothing. And they're like, well, you know, this, this, this. I'm like, I did it when I had three kids and one client and a lot of debt and made it. And you can too. But it it takes a lot of courage to go that way. And there's a lot of people that will just say, nope, that's just not practical. It's not not wisdom. It's not what everyone else is doing. So how do you find and attract clients that say, okay, I'm not scared to look at an alternative, even though other people are saying 401k is the way to go or these other traditional investments. How do you find or attract or what do you look for in a client, Judy, who says, yeah, I'm interested. I'm not going to just dismiss you out of hand because of this. I think part of it, John, is that from deep within me, I generate a lot of passion and excitement about what I do. And part of that is because I gratefully learned about how to do this at a time when I really needed help. And so I actually used some of my mentors as my um, financial planners, if you want to call it that. And they helped take me from where I was to where I am today. And I implemented these strategies six, eight years ago. And I'm living proof that they work. So nobody really even knows that. But I think deep down in, I have that level of passion and excitement because I know what could be. Now, on the Simon Sinek curve, what do they say? The top 16% are the ones that really embrace something new that's coming out. And I know that there's a lot of people on the other end of the curve and I can, I'm starting to get to the point where I realize who those people are. And if they're 
if their heels are dug in or all of a sudden they become their own financial planning expert because they don't want someone else telling them something that they didn't know they didn't know. Uh, I just let them go. I think that's a huge lesson for everyone listening right now is do not, you have to find people that are open and receptive to your vision, to your strategy, to your idea. Yeah. You, you cannot just bang your head against a brick wall trying to convince people of something they don't want to be convinced of. I just got a, off a call today with a gentleman that wants to do LinkedIn marketing. And he's, you know, he's in his 50s or 60s. And he's like, I have these other two partners. They think LinkedIn's a waste of time and social media is a waste of time and they're old school, cold call, networking meetings. And can you help me sell them? And I was like, no. Like, <laughs> I mean, they have to want to see that. They have to want to at least it's dismissed out of hand enough to go, well, maybe there is something here. Like I, I'm like, unless there's an opening, there's no sense in you and I wasting our time. And, and I think that's key. And what's really nice about what you're doing, Judy, too, from a, the, my marketing brain saying, you're really standing out online, your mm -hmm. personal brand, you're kind of putting a stake in the ground. And this is Simon Sinek, you said, like, what's your why, you know, your why you do definitely, as people get to know you and know your brand and consume your content, like you are genuinely like care about people and want them to be happy and be successful and that you are passionate about. If you believe in something, you're all in. Yeah. And that comes through with, with different parts of your life. And what I like about that from a branding perspective for you is Judy's not trying to be everything to everyone and she's yeah. not trying to please everyone. And she's not going to, you know, what I like about you is you're not afraid to say to somebody, well, of course, you know, someone's going to tell you that they don't believe in it. So why would they be open to it? You know, and, and you've got to think for yourself and, and have your own viewpoints. And so let's walk through this a little bit to whatever degree you want to share. Like, what are the alternatives that you're suggesting to clients instead of the traditional 401k and getting hammered later on with unpredictable taxes and things like that? What's, what's kind of your strategy? Walk me through when a client comes to you and says, okay, Judy, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. What, what does this game plan look like for me? So the first question I might ask a client is, imagine all of your wealth on the day you choose to retire in a circle. And let's consider that circle a pie. I'll make the first slice of the pie from the center of the circle down, hand you the pen, and say, what percentage of your retirement assets do you want to share with the IRS on a monthly basis? It's a great question. Most yeah. people say, well, just draw the line right over the line you just drew. Yeah, I'm not interested in giving all my money to them. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then I say, do you have any idea what percentage you're at today? Mm. And when I tell them 30 to 40 to possibly 50%, and that's based on the tax rates that are in effect today, that's a shock factor right there. And I say, if you're interested in moving the needle to 0%, I can help you do that. But it's going to be changing your mind about the way wealth really works in this country. Are you ready to take the journey? I, I like what you're doing, and I, I love the marketing lessons in this as well for anyone who's not in financial services, obviously, but just anyone in general. How Notice how Judy is really moving a prospect or a prospective client through kind of you know explaining the problem, getting someone curious. Because yes, draw a circle, put all your wealth in there. Now tell me how much you want to give to the government. Well, I don't want to give any. Well, right now, you're exposed to giving 30 to 50%. Do you want to change that? Yes or no? Right. And if the person says yes, you can keep moving forward. If they say no, it's a pretty quick meeting, I assume. Very quick. So tell me the other thing. I didn't know this, but another point you brought up when we were, we got into this the other day, <laughs> which is so fun. Like you're so fired up about it. I'm like, I kept pushing back. You said something like you're the fifth person when you cash out your retirement. Is, what's the analogy? You're like the fifth person to get paid. Explain that again. Right. Did you know, well, in the state of Colorado and also the state of Minnesota, that you're fifth in line to receive money out of your retirement distributions? So when you take a distribution in retirement, 
the first person that gets paid is the federal government because most people today are saving money into accounts that are gonna be taxable upon distribution. So they take their distribution, they pay the taxes to the federal government, and oh, by the way, do you know what the federal tax rate is gonna be when you start taking those distributions in retirement? How many years down the road is that gonna be? Huh, I have no idea. Do you know what the tax rate might be? No. So that's one, that's the first in line. Second in line is state taxes. Now, some states don't have state taxes. Other states have higher tax rates than other states. And if you decide to retire in California, your state tax rate is going to be much higher than it is in the state, perhaps when you are postponing those taxes. Oh, see, you didn't even think about this. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, most people are unaware that when they report income on their 1040, once they've turned on their social security benefits, up to 85% of that free benefit could be subject to ordinary income taxes, which again, we don't know what the ordinary income tax rate is going to be upon those distributions. And for the average American couple with today's tax rates, we're looking at about a quarter of a million dollars of unnecessary taxes that they may send to the IRS during their retirement years if the tax code doesn't change for what percentage of your Social Security benefits are subject to taxation. Uh, most people are unaware that Medicare premiums are means tested based on the income you report on your 1040 once you start taking Medicare benefits. Um, today, it can be anywhere from $135 per month per person up to $430 per month per person. And interestingly enough, most people don't also realize that the government takes your Medicare premium out of your Social Security check before they send you your Social Security check every month. So it's just a math calculation that's done at the government level. Oh, and then fifth, you. You get what's left over. Finally, <laughs> this is so depressing. <laughs> You've painted, thanks, Debbie Downer, right? Wah, wah. Like, but it's true. Like, the circle just got really small. So it's like to recap this at a simple level, because I'm not a, a financial guru. So it's number one is the uh, federal government, two is the state, three is income tax, four yes. is the Medicaid. No, uh, three is taxes on your social security benefits. Oh, I can't, okay, never mind. I can't keep trailing. Everyone's getting their cut except me of my it's money. Not Medicaid, it's Medicare. Okay. <laughs> You're just not old enough yet, John. I'm moving to Canada. I, I give up. <laughs> I'm done. I'm close enough. I'm in Minnesota. So, <laughs> all right, so now that you've depressed us all, now that all of us have a bleak future, uh, not to mention, too, and I don't know if this relates, and I haven't asked you about this before, but I just remember the last recession we had when everyone's 401ks hit the toilet. Right. How that really, I mean, are you able, because you're presenting alternatives, right. is that money better protected? Oh, yeah. Okay. See, so oh, that's yeah. another doomsday scenario that you can avoid. Yeah. In um, fact, John. Yeah. None of my clients have lost any money the last couple of days. Hmm. And we're talking during a time for people that don't know if we don't share the dates that the markets had some big drops. Oh, but yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there are ways to park your wealth in assets that are not correlated to the market. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's just, I remember this so vividly. Uh, I mean, I grew up, you know, in the eighties, so I remember black Monday and, and, you know, 87 and all that stuff. And I remember, but this most recent recession, 08, 09, I remember so many people, my parents age and stuff that were like, I can't retire now. The right. house I had in Oregon is gone. Right? right. Like I literally have to go back to work. Right. And it was like that. It, it reminded me of some of these other catastrophic events where it's like, that shouldn't be the case. I was trying to explain the great depression to my kids. And I'm like, right. yeah, you put money in the bank the stock crashed, the bank had invested in all these bad stocks and you went to the bank, they didn't have your money. Right. It's like, that's not a good plan. No, <laughs> so, no, okay. So we depressed everyone. <laughs> Let, what's the solution? What, what's your plan? How do we avoid this? 
Well, first of all, it's worth it to recognize that most all financial advisors, financial planners, CPAs, tax attorneys, investment managers, wealth advisors, friends, family, neighbors, all they talk about, and even if you're in social settings and you peek your ear, they're talking about how to accumulate more wealth to get to a nest egg at the top of the mountain. Here's another geometrical shape, which is just the mountain. We talked about the circle. Now we're talking about the mountain. Pretty simple. And they help them get to the top of their wealth mountain with no map to navigate the descent. So we start by educating people on how is your wealth going to distribute during the descent. And once they understand the tax code and how the tax code uh, taxes taxable wealth that you've been accumulating, they're like, there's got to be another way. So we educate then people on strategies that have existed in the tax code for over 100 years where the wealth that's distributed from them is literally exempt from income taxes. So if a person is willing to embrace that education, that new knowledge, that understanding, and it takes some time for people, uh, and they choose to execute it, then they're far better off than 95% of all Americans. And I, I love the marketing lesson as well. I, I, my marketing brain never turns off, Judy. So I'm listening and I'm going, you're doing a masterful job of educating. Whoever educates the most wins in, yeah. in branding and marketing and lead generation. Because if you can educate someone and demonstrate expertise and help them in a simple way, see what the problem is and then mm -hmm. present a solution, you yeah. win a lot more business. And you're using great, Simple, and this is something I would encourage all the different financial services professionals listening or watching is really one of Judy's gifts is she can really simplify. And mm -hmm. for someone like me, I don't know anything about, I hate finances. I hate, to, I just, I like go into the fetal position. But when you explain it with like the circle analogy and then the mountain and how to get down the mountain and yeah, no, everyone helped you get to the top. But now when you come down, how do you make it? I, I like these analogies. Um, so you're obviously talking about, you know, different investment models, methods, I assume policies or something that people can put money into without going into the, the weeds too much and, and doing your whole secret sauce. What, what, what does that look like? Or how is that approach? What's that strategy for people to, you know, kind of get less wealth tax on the back end? Right. I will talk about another simple shape. Okay. And I don't know if most people are familiar with the shape, but it's an exponential curve that starts out low, it stays flat for some years, and then all of a sudden the curve goes way up. And it's called the compound growth curve. It's a very simple shape. And what most people don't know is how to keep their wealth on the uninterrupted compound growth curve for the rest of their lives. Most people are putting money into any type of an account where later on they're drawing down the account to make a large purchase, send kids to college, buy a second home, and they're hopping off the uninterrupted compound growth curve never to return to that curve again. So we also educate our clients on strategies where once their wealth is parked in certain accounts, it will never hop off the uninterrupted compound growth curve. And people have a hard time understanding that, especially when it comes to retirement distributions, because out of any account that you can think of, when you take a distribution for retirement, you're no longer on that curve. And we want people on that curve to life expectancy. This is fascinating. So I just thought of a couple of things. And one of the smartest people on earth, and I remember this because it came up in another conversation I had with someone about this topic, uh, compound interest. That's what we're talking about, right? Right. Okay. So guess who said this? This person said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He right. who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. That's right. 
Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. So, <laughs> I'm like, I saw that quote and I'm like, okay, I should probably, it's so funny because we as humans, we don't want to have to learn something that we're not passionate about. And I feel like retirement and investing in money, so many of us are like, I don't want to deal with it. I have my friend, Kevin yeah. or Jane. I just, I'm just going to let them deal with it. But people like Judy show up and then get me all like fired. <laughs> because, because you're so passionate about it and you're so genuine about it. And the other thing I like about Judy that also works really well from a marketing standpoint for her is she has this credibility and authority. CPA, right. licensures, like you're not, you know, work for big firms. So it's like, if you think about this, if you're branding and marketing yourself, uh, financial services or otherwise, like you've got to really have that initial credibility yeah. and then people will take you seriously. Otherwise you're just a conspiracy theory nut or whatever it might, or you're just out of left field or aliens are taking the money or whatever. But it's like, when you start to put these pieces together, like Judy's doing with her platform, you're seeing, okay, she has the credibility. She's worked in the industry. She has a personal involvement with this. It's not theory for her. It's, you know, how, and you've gone into it with me about your family journey and everything else, but how that really came through for your family. Right. But then, then you start layering on additional credibility where Einstein says compound interest is, you know, one of the most powerful forces in the universe. Now you've really got people interested. And, and I yep. think this is where, where your story really gets powerful, right? Because now at this point, what's a prospect want to know next? So Einstein only missed it by one word. You talked about compound interest, right? Mm -hmm. The word he missed is uninterrupted. Oh. Interesting, huh? Yes. Yeah, because... <sighs> It just keeps going. It's that curve. That, see, I like your shapes. I feel like we should have little blocks for the presentation, <laughs> circles and triangles. But, but it's so important to simplify. Right. And I think a, a confused prospect never buys. And right. what, it's same with investing. A confused investor doesn't invest. And I think what Judy's doing a brilliant job of, and I knew this is why I wanted to have you on the podcast and on you know, the video, is not only will people find this really intriguing for their own investment and their own wealth planning and I encourage everybody who wants to call Judy, right? She's, she's the guru of this stuff. But I think, too, there's just a lot of brilliant marketing and sales and lead generation methods in this that we can take and do in any industry. And I really salute you that you figured this out. Like, where did this come from for you? How did you decide that this was going to be your approach and have it work so well? So I do have mentors that have mentored me, but uh, and I have years worth of knowledge and information and journaling and writing and blog posts that I, I just churn information. In fact, this morning, I think I may have posted my newest uh, idea on our blog on our blog this morning. <laughs> um, Every morning when I'm in the shower, I think of a new way to articulate what it is I do. And so I'm constantly churning that. And then, but at the end of the day, you need to take all this information that you've got and, and you're such an expert, but you've got to bring it down to the level that someone who has absolutely no idea what you're talking about can understand it and continually check in with them as you're talking with them and educating them. Now, do you have any questions about that? Does this make sense to you? How are you feeling about the information that you're learning today? Um, I had a couple in my office yesterday and they're 55 and they're shocked at the news about the tax implications of the wealth they've been building. And they are in, been in incredible stewards of their wealth mm. and have significant accumulated wealth that could literally vanish in retirement if it's exposed to unknown future tax rates and market volatility. And at the end of the day, they, they were like, how come we can be 55 and never have heard of this? And I got to tell you this, John, they went to their 
current advisors and got to the bottom of the fees they're paying on the money that their advisors are managing for them and they're irate about it. So then they told me that they went to visit a fiduciary last week. And that's another word that gets thrown around a lot in the financial services industry is, are you a fiduciary? In other words, do you have your client's best interest in mind? Oh, okay. And they told me that they told this fiduciary that they were meeting with me this week. And he said, disregard anything she says, because whatever she's doing is underhanded and under the table. Oh, and not legal. <laughs> yep. So it, this is interesting to me because, and this is, I guess we're doing a little deeper dive on an industry, of course, but for me, personal experience one of the things I, as a solo business owner in charge of my own future, I didn't have an employer plan. So I was shopping around for financial advisors about a year ago before I met you, unfortunately, <laughs> but oh, I'll, still, I'll still give you all my stuff. But <laughs> one of the things I was looking at, Judy, as a investor, as a consumer was, who, where can I find someone who doesn't have a dog in the fight? In, yeah. in, in other words, I wanted someone who was independent, who was like, I don't have to shoehorn you into... Um, Ameriprise. I don't have to shoehorn you into my company's little plan, right? And so I was trying to do it on my own, like with Vanguard, and I was so confused. I was like, what do all these letters mean? Did I put it in the right? Like, I was so dumb at this. I put money in and I didn't, it just sat there. And I'm like, why am I not making money? I hadn't converted it into whatever it had to convert into to start gaining interest. <laughs> like, so that's my wife's like, stop. Like, you don't know what you're doing. Um, but it, there is something to be said for finding an independent voice who doesn't have a dog in the fight. And that's what I like about branding and positioning yourself in the marketplace is to say genuinely, especially in the high trust industries, like I don't have a dog in the fight for you. I, I you know, I'm going to put your money wherever it makes sense. I did this on a coaching call yesterday that I paid someone to coach me about, growing my business. And I was coming in gung ho about, I want to really sell more online courses and do this and this and this. And this person who uh, is ahead of me and who I wanted to, you know, pay for advice said, I don't have a dog in the fight. You know, you're paying me for my honest opinion. Here's what you need to do instead. Mm -hmm. Like, these are the right things to do. Right. And this person said, look, I'm the online course guru. I could just tell you all that and sell you more of my stuff. But that's not what you should be doing. Based on what you're telling me, you should do these things. Yeah. And I walked out of that call with so much more respect because they weren't just trying to shove me into their products. They yeah. really legitimately were like, you don't need my stuff, go do this instead. So, so I like that about you. I like that about people positioning themselves in the marketplace. So let's bring this in for landing because I know we've covered a ton. How can people, if they do want to reach out to you, Judy, and, and learn more and get more insight and education around this unique perspective, what are the best places to find you online and connect? Right. So I am on LinkedIn. Judy Carlson. Um, I also have a website. It's called Coram Deo Financial, and that's C-O-R-A-M-D-E-O -E Financial. I also have a phone number that comes directly to me, and I love receiving phone calls, and I answer all of them now because I just like to, but I have to hang up on the solicitors right, right. Uh Yeah, no, my phone number is 720 Four four five one three zero eight, and I love conversations with people. That's my favorite thing to do. Um, and I have an email address at it's Judy at CorumDaleFinancial dot com. What and tell me why? What's the company name? What's the story behind that? Because oh, I found that interesting. Oh, Corum Dale Financial. Yeah, I worked uh, at a couple different agencies where there was an agency owner. And so that person more or less dictated how we were going to run our business. And it, a lot of the principles were inconsistent with what I believed to be true. And so several years ago, when I went out on my own and I knew that I needed an authority figure, um, and I, have, I had used the words Coram Deo, over my spiritual journey. And it, it was just so obvious because Coram Deo means in the presence of God, under the authority of God, for the glory of God. And to be perfectly honest with you, John, I can't do what I'm doing 
to help other people unless I sit under the authority of God. And there, well, it's a pretty good authority figure to have. <laughs> you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, and I like that because um, you know we're both believers, and I'm pretty open about that. But what I find refreshing, and the reason I wanted you to mention that was there's a lot of people that will put the little fish logo on their stuff. One of the most crooked contractors I ever worked with had all these Bible verses and fish on their pamphlets wow. and i'm like well they're a believer certainly and they were like the word <laughs> yeah the proof is in the pudding the proof is in how someone performs right. and, and i like the fact that from what i've seen of you and talking to you and getting to know you and that's why i wanted to share you kind of with my audience was you really do practice what you preach in terms of trying to serve other people trying to have you know remind yourself of of what your mission is and so that's just really cool i just think this episode has been really fun because you've shared so many good lessons about personal branding, about relationship building, about trust, about how to sell, how to open up loops and create curiosity and how to simplify complex topics so that your audience can understand that and get excited. And then also how to deal with critics who are going to try to, you know, sidetrack you because they have their own self-interest and how to stand out from the market because you can say, I don't have a dog in the fight for you. I really don't care where we put your money. I just want it to serve you. So great stuff, Judy Carlson. Thank you so much for being a guest and really appreciate everything. Thanks, John. Love being here with you. 